we live? Yes. Where are we are. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Wow, what a crowd. It's amazing. We have a very special day because we're opening a new exhibition. And um, what's very special, but what's also a bit sad, something old, something new is also always uh, also a bit sad is that today we're saying goodbye to our former chairman, Jan Post. We will start with that. After that, we will have the world premiere for the film Born at Night. We're very happy. Thank you, Space Candia. And um, I will introduce them later. Uh, after the film, uh, we have a short talk between uh, Joseph, Martina and Jura. And uh, then we will have drinks again. But first, uh, let's enjoy this uh, event. Um, Maarten, will you do the honor to... Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, Anamon, and take care of the Duitje. <laughs> Oké. Okay. Um, jongens en meisjes, dames en heren, um, ladies and gentlemen, I will try to speak some words in English, because Anamon told me last week that this, the opening of the exhibition would be um, visited by a lot of people from all over the world. I thought she was joking, but she's, she's um, uh, often joking, but this time I see that there are a lot of people from all around the world. That makes us very proud. Uh, but before I'm going to tell some words to Jan Post, also known as John Mill. <laughs> That's his own joke. I have the honor, Jan to announce a lot of things today, uh, but also that one of the most important elder men of the city of Eindhoven, maybe one of the most important elder men, elder women in this case, of the region, maybe of the Netherlands, is here with us, because on a very busy day, she wanted especially the chance to say some words to you. May I introduce to you Miriam Schurs. Thank you. Thank you. I just walked in for the, the drinks and they said to me, do you want to say something? And I said, well, why not? No, it's really not. Why not? For this is again a wonderful exhibition that we are able to see here. And in Eindhoven, what we do most of the time is we create something new, and as soon as, as it's there, we create something again. We just don't reflect. And sometime, sometimes it's important to reflect. And what I want you to reflect upon is that you are sitting here is not something that happens easy. Yes, you are sitting in a dream, but dreams are hard work to realize. And it took an enormous amount of time to realize this dream. And an enormous effort. Are you going to cry at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> and an enormous effort from Anamo and her gallant partner Kun to persist. And of course, the words are for you, Jan Anderson. You need people who stand by you all the time. And apparently you judge it the moment to step down because you have done that enough, you can say, well, it's okay now. 
Zone von der Sie. Please get it. What you see is Anamon is wearing her dancing shoes. Normally she is in black all the way. But the wonderful moment that we are able to celebrate now is yes, it has been tremendously hard work. And yes, blood, sweat and tears. And yes, everybody is still working beyond what everybody imagined capable. But it's full of energy because the end is in sight and it's only about adding things. Things that give you energy. So it has been a tremendous struggle, but the struggle is over. It still is hard work, and it will continue to be here for, well, the next 50 years. <laughs> People never stop nowadays. <laughs> At least 50 years. So let's celebrate who made this possible. Let's celebrate having dreams. Let's celebrate being Eindhoven. the only thing you have given Eindhoven. Something that we don't talk about is that Jan is also part of a subsidy system in the province of Brabant. And he looks upon Eindhoven very, with a very kind eye. And he tells other people what is happening there that is important. And being an ambassador is very precious to all of us. So let's drink to Jan. Not only because he is part of making this possible, but because we know that he will make things happen in Eindhoven in whichever way that he sees the possibility. He also came along with Kiki and Joost. So if you, he's now, he's free now, so if you need to <laughs> So, you have no drink. Okay. Yeah. Everybody who has a glass and everybody who doesn't have a glass pretends to have a glass. And let's raise the glass to people who love culture but also love making it happen. Too young. Thank you very much, Marian. Thank you for being here today with us. And please bring our congratulations to Maximilian, your son, who is celebrating his 20th birthday today. <laughs> Thank you well. Uh, Jan, after this uh, hug of the one, one of the most important elder women of the region, 
you might get also a hug of one of the majors of the region. <laughs> but we'll see at the end of the evening. <laughs> that's not that's not why we're here. Uh, as Alamon already thought, uh, it's a little bit of a sad moment, but also a very happy moment. Happy moment, John. We are uh, today here for saying a few words to you because Jan Post, John Mill, is the founding father of the Kazerne. It's true. Marianne told us already that uh, the idea of the Kazerne comes from Anamon and Kuhn. We all know that. But without Jan Post, I don't know if he would have been here today in this Kazerne. Because Jan has a large garden. And in that garden, it's almost more than 10 years ago, Jan invited some people, some people who were studying at that time at one of the academies here in Brabant. And together with Kunin on the Moon, in that garden, in a small, how is that now in het Engels, a bosje, a parkje. Good, a parkje in Eindhoven called the Wielerwald. Um, <laughs> they had a small talk about the idea of Kuhn and Anamon. And from now on I want to continue in Dutch, not because Jan wouldn't understand an English speech, uh, but uh, uh, to be honest, my native language is uh, Lunis. <laughs> it's almost like Eindhoven's, within two years I'm sure. <laughs> Don't tell it to John, Mama. <laughs> Maybe, uh, um, but because uh, for me it's not possible, Jan, to give all the emotions in a non-native language. Vandaag, dames en heren, u heeft net al een klein traantje bij de monik gezien. Ik zie Bert is ook al snotteren. Maar het is, het is niet zomaar iets. Jan Post is echt de grondlegger van de kazerne geweest. Het is echt zo dat in zijn tuin. Na heel veel initiatieven van Koen en Moon, Anne Moon, een aantal mensen gewoon bij elkaar zijn gaan zitten op jouw verzoek. Om eens even, zoals dat hier in Brabant heet, met de beker over elkaar te gaan kijken hoe die wilde ideeën, want dat waren het echt, ik mocht er af en toe ook bij zijn, van Koen en Anne Moon, op een of andere manier waarheid zouden kunnen gaan worden. En ik moet eerlijk zeggen, ik geloof dat het 2008 was, toen ik de verhalen hoorde tijdens de vele pop-up restaurants die jullie al hier in de stad aan het organiseren waren. Het was wel heel erg ambitieus. En Jan, het is absoluut dankzij jouw enthousiasme, jouw doorzettingsvermogen, jouw netwerk, je ervaring, je kracht, je overredingskracht. En zo heb ik nog wel een hele waslijst aan andere superlatieven die op jou van toepassing zijn, die er mede voor hebben gezorgd, maar ook vooral voor hebben gezorgd dat uiteindelijk de kazerne hier echt zijn deuren heeft geopend. En dat er hier echt mensen komen eten, dat er hier exposities zijn en dat er op een dag als vandaag... Het is inmiddels april 2018, we zijn ruim tien jaar verder na die befaamde tuinsessie bij jullie thuis, Wiljan, want dat geldt natuurlijk ook voor jou. Uh, we zijn enorm ver, we staan aan de vooravond van weer een nieuwe fase, wat we in het bestuur fase 2 noemen, de fase waarin de dromen van Anne Moon weer verder vorm gaan krijgen. En dat die zo, zo weer verder vorm gaan kunnen gaan krijgen, hebben we uiteindelijk allemaal te danken aan die mensen die aan het begin hun nek hebben uitgestoken. Er zijn er heel erg veel, maar er was er eentje die als eerste zijn nek uitstak en als eerste geloofde in het concept, in de droom van Anne en Koen. En dat was jij Jan. Dus ik wil jou toch vragen om, nu ik zo'n beetje aan het einde van mijn verhaal ben gekomen, langzaam en zeker hier naar voren te komen. Om twee redenen. De eerste reden is dat ik je dan goed in je ogen kan kijken, maar je dadelijk ook even de microfoon kan geven, want jouw kennende ga jij nergens weg zonder ook even iets gezegd te hebben. En die kans die krijg je van me. Maar voordat dat uh, gebeurt, voordat ik jou de microfoon ga geven, wil ik ook wil Jan nog eventjes aankijken, zodat ook waar iedereen bij is, het credo achter een sterke man staat, een sterke vrouw, meer dan ooit op deze situatie van toepassing is. Jan, we hebben jou de afgelopen tien jaar ook mogen meemaken als een uitermate sterke vrouw. Die zelfs op de momenten dat, ja zeker dames en heren, die momenten zijn er geweest, Jan even niet meer in het concept van de kazerne geloofde. Was er wel Jan, die zei, jawel Jan, we, we gaan daarmee door. Ik 
heb het regelmatig horen zeggen. Ik heb het niet geturfd en ik zal je verder ook niet met getallen vermoeien. Maar William, we zijn jou minstens net zo dankbaar. Terug naar Jan. Jan, um, de vader van de kazerne is al een eigen titel op zich. Maar we hebben er natuurlijk wel over nagedacht hoe er iemand die door de koning al is verheven tot de ridderstand. Het was weliswaar in Amsterdam, maar goed, dat telt ook. <lacht> en er waren eindtovenaren bij, dus dat scheelt dan weer. Hoe we zo iemand kunnen eren. En wij hebben met het huidige bestuur twee dingen bedacht. Het eerste is, en dat weten we van jou beste Jan, jij bent geen man die grote voorpagina artikelen hoeft of enorm in het zonnetje hoeft te staan. Wat voor jou heel belangrijk is, en hebben we al die avonden, soms ook nachten meegemaakt, weekenden, dagen dat we door hebben gepraat om dingen mogelijk te maken. Het gaat er jou om dat jij een glaasje kan drinken en een hapje kan eten met de mensen die dicht bij jou staan en wie jij samen tot resultaat bent gekomen. Want ja Jan, jij bent inderdaad heel belangrijk en wij noemen jou graag de vader van de kazerne. Maar er zitten hier heel veel mensen bij elkaar en ik kijk speciaal ook even aan de mode aan die samen met jou het resultaat hebben mogen boeken. Dus om die reden hebben we er ook voor gekozen om speciaal vandaag, speciaal met deze mensen die allemaal bij elkaar zijn, in aanwezigheid van het inmiddels alweer nieuwe bestuur, jou met een paar woorden toe te spreken. Dat heeft Merien gedeeltelijk gedaan, dat is met ons de verjaardag van de zomer vieren. En ik probeer in ieder geval namens het bestuur die emotie over te brengen die we met z'n allen voelen. Enerzijds de vreugde dat we dit met z'n allen hebben mogen bereiken. Anderzijds, eh, toch een beetje verdriet dat we afscheid gaan nemen van jou, maar jij hebt wel beloofd dat je ons blijft helpen. Vooral om jonge mensen te blijven enthousiasmeren in de creatieve industrie. En jouw vertrek biedt natuurlijk ook plaats aan een aantal andere jonge, ambitieuze, talentvolle mensen om plaats te nemen in het bestuur. En om die reden, beste Jan, willen wij graag ook jou uitdagen. Zonder daar een concrete opdracht aan mee te geven, in tegendeel, dat is niet de bedoeling. Maar wij willen jou graag eren met de ere die jou toekomt. Iedereen is de kazerne altijd begonnen. Niet voor zichzelf, maar om de jonge mensen uit de creatieve industrie, uit Nederland, Europa, maar vooral ook wereldwijd, een kans te geven zich te ontwikkelen. En je hebt hier ook altijd enorm voor ingezet, Jan, om die mogelijkheid te bieden. Dat is ook altijd het concept van de kazerne geweest. Laten we met z'n allen voor zorgen dat we een platform hebben om die creatieve industrie te blijven ontwikkelen. De hele kazerne blijft zich ontwikkelen om dat te gaan doen. Maar ik wil jou vragen, Jan, of jij de komende jaren je wil blijven inzetten om op wat voor manier dan ook die jonge mensen samen met ons, samen met de kazerne waar jij de vader van bent, de kans te blijven geven. En hoe we dat gaan doen en hoe actief dat gaat zijn, dat weet ik niet. Maar het geeft ons een hele mooie gelegenheid om van tijd tot tijd een reden te hebben om jou te bellen. En om af en toe bij jou langs te komen. En dan hoop ik dat ik weer net zo'n lekkere bosse bol krijg. Had jij die verzorgd? Hij heeft hem zelf gehaald. Als, uh, als daar ik de laatste keer heb gekregen. Jan, ik ga afronden. Um, om al deze enerzijds, ik hoop, mooie woorden, maar anderzijds ook um, een belangrijke taak aan jou uh, te geven, hebben wij nagedacht over een titel die wij jou kunnen geven. Een titel die naast vader van de kazerne ook echt de vlag en de lading dekt. We hebben er in het bestuur over nagedacht, we hebben er met mensen over gepraat en het moest een titel zijn die eenmalig is, die uniek is. Want er kan maar één iemand toen, ruim tien jaar geleden, bij hem achter in zijn tuintje, op het terrasje met een aantal mensen, de kiem hebben gelegd voor de kazerne. Dus, is het mij een grote eer, beste Jan, om vandaag aan jou mee te delen, ten overstaan van al deze mensen, daartoe gemandeerd, gemandeerd door zowel directie als het voltallig bestuur, om jou te benoemen voor de unieke titel, voor eens en voor altijd. Je kan hem niet weigeren en je komt er ook nooit meer vanaf. Dames en heren, Jan Post is de enige erevoorzitter van de kazerne. Jan Bij. In dit geval gelukkig zonder zo'n ingewikkelde bewaardoos waar je de handleiding bij hebt. Ik ga hem je opspelden en dan mag je maar wel Jan laten zien. Het, logo, het is het logo van Koen. Um, nou gebeurt mij iets wat mij wel eens vaker gebeurt, namelijk ik die microfoon kwijt. Als jij die nou eens in jouw linkerhand houdt, dan kan ik hem bij jou. Is dat links? 
Dames en heren, Jan Post, de enige eerdevoorzitter in de Gerrit challenge to introduce this unknown small record and disc player into the world and we did it together with the dire straits and it was also during three years that we traveled around the world showing this fantastic masterpiece from Eindhoven to the world and I'm starting with these words I, I won't take a long speech but, but uh, since that time I was so convinced that uh, Western Europe and especially Holland with the Western Europe and within Holland, Eindhoven is the center of science, technology, imagination, working together. So we travel around the world and uh, we stayed, my wife and myself and our children, we, you don't hear it? No. We stayed, we stayed uh, eight years abroad, we came back in Eindhoven. Uh, I was involved in, uh, in, the whole, in the whole restructuring of Philips Centurion, I learned there a lot. And since that time when I left Stuarts, I used my experience to help uh, art companies uh, to improve their plans, to restructure and to believe in their futures. And it was, uh, it was around about 10 years ago, as already Martin said, 10 years ago, I was seeing with my wife that more and more uh, graduates from the uh, Design Academy were not leaving straight away from Amsterdam or Rotterdam or Paris or Berlin, no. Uh, the first of them were staying in Eindhoven at that time, believing in Eindhoven. So we heard from Annelies Herbsen, uh, at that time, uh, and, and still a very good, excellent food designer. We said, Annelies, we be you her, uh, we like to invite a couple of those graduates to our house, because we like, my wife and myself, we like to help you to further develop your activities in the Eindhoven area. So Annelies uh, invited Moon and Koen, and Moon alone you can to totally forget. If you like Moon, you get Koen at the same time. And <laughs> <laughs> now, within a few weeks, you, will, you are going to understand that this couple, there is of course the secret. A few words later on about that. And but also Piet and Eek was there, Kiki and Joost were there, and a few others. All together around about 12 top designers. And, uh, and since that time, we know of course uh, Mona Kuma with Betten and it was a few months 
Duits beter. Het was in de garde nog al een ben dat ze uh, Ramon met Mons Mon en Cotinox viel. Ik dacht, ja, ik kan het trusten. Dat is basically the point. I like to share together with school my dreams with him. And of course, when you are as young as my home, then you will only get it the same time, of course. And so Mom was telling me that she said, in this Eindhoven for the coming 20, 50 years, we are missing a place where we can show our designs, where Europe can show their designs, where the world can show their designs, where we can talk and study about designs, where you can eat, drink, sleep, that's our idea. And I said, well, that's a very nice story, but where? And she said, well, at the neighbor's house, the barracks, the old Marcelle Caserne. And she was talking to an, uh, to an old reserve, Marcelle officer, so that helps a lot, of course. <laughs> so uh, it was a huge challenge to convince the local government that that property <coughs> of them, this Caserne, to, uh, to allow us as team, uh, Mon and Kuhn uh, in front, to, uh, to, to change the destination for, that, for these buildings in such a way that we could, could, could create uh, an exposition uh, area for design and uh, for meeting rooms and eating and sleeping. And uh, Mary and Schreurs, Mary already she talked, uh, I think she did a great job in convincing her board and her colleagues that this was the right plan with the right people, she must have thought, uh, talking about Mon and Kuhn. And uh, in the meantime, we had, uh, we had formed <coughs> the, the board, the team, the managing team. Uh, Mon came with, uh, with Martin. Uh, Kuhn came with the better workers, uh, both musicians. Brett is a good singer and saxophonist. And I myself, I came with, with Otto Wiedemann, uh, the fiscalist. And we all knew each other already five or ten years longer, so you know who I was invited. And that team is still a strong team. And uh, so, so we convinced Marianne to, to allow us to execute these plans. And also we had to find an investor to buy the building from Marianne, you could say, from the government. That took quite some time, but we found a famous uh, family who did already a lot for Philips, uh, and especially this part of, uh, of South East Brabant, Gova, the family Govaars. I don't know if they're still here, and there are people come definitely. But the Govaars convinced this family to buy the whole complex, and we as a team could hire from <coughs> the family and put the premises here. And so we did. And so we started the whole project. Now uh, already a few times we are uh, enjoying good dinners and nice expositions here. And uh, for me it was time to say goodbye. The moment we were sure that the whole finance arrangement was under control for the hotel part, which is now under construction and will be opened at the end of this year, if you want to leave this design, or even just before that. But you can't leave uh, before taking care that you have a good successor. So we found that the best successor you can imagine because Brent van der Els sitting over left there is, uh, is my memory and it's also a couple we see them always together in the world of art and <coughs> business but especially in the of art and I knew him already and I said well, he would be the right, the, right, the right man with all his context, his interest especially in design and uh, I asked him and he said within 24 hours, Jan, deal, this is a fantastic challenge, I'm going to succeed you. So since in a few months Brett is my successor, and it feels very good when you have to say goodbye, and you have an excellent successor. So I think, together with the, with the team, uh, they will further develop all these plans, and I'm sure that uh, Eindhoven can benefit from a fantastic uh, project like the Caserne. I'm, I'm going to stop. I feel very proud to be my lot. Ere, ere voorzitter. Was er ere voorzitter? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this lady, uh, only the country has only one, one example of such a lady, and this is, I don't know, it's only one on one.
is uh, of art, music, design, totally. A group organizing. Uh, but also now back to you on the moon, important is to, to, to repeat perhaps that in her brains, in her character, she is so strong, so continuing to do a great job, not for herself, no. She does it for all her colleagues and designers. She does it for especially for Eindhoven. Uh, we, we, we talk many very often, but not many in the case of we have to earn the fortune out of this whole shit. Not at all. They said it's high time that Eindhoven can invite the world. And this is the project. She did a fantastic job. And the man strongly behind day and night could give him a <laughs> together with Martina Muzzi is really, really great and really interesting and provoking because it's not the design we are used here in Eindhoven. So I'm looking forward uh, especially to all the discussions we will have about, but let's not do that today. <laughs> um, Joseph, uh, Martina and Jura van Zevde from Van Zelberg Institute, thank you. Uh, we'll talk later on, but first we will go into the premiere, the world premiere of the film Born at Night. Thank you. 
，第二层货架上。三包或者四包都可以。你刚不是问过你爸了吗？我爸没告诉我。应该就是这个吧。你问一下你爸是不是这个？爸爸是不是这么样子？
ได้เปลี่ยนอ่านกระทำกับเราแล้วนี่คือสมัยกายใช่ไหมจะมีการที่ชื่อเสียงแบบนี้ไม่ถือว่าทำแล้วจุดจุดนึงก็测试效果就是这样。最终想要的。还有，还有个东西啊。嗯。我人家呢把这个孔，这个孔啊，闭掉。闭掉，要不然的话也大眼，大眼都细的。<笑>真的，你看这个孔，这个板又厚。嗯。嗯是。你看啊、哦，一个，两个。<笑>一把三个，我这有一点，他我万一可以搬到这里，呃，他，你拿去焊，这个再拿，再拿去焊，再拿去焊，焊焊焊斜了，然后看能不能搬这来，焊，比如一万，嗯，就这样，你看能不能三百六十度转过它来。就想焊了，我焊就走了。嗯，焊歪我，一定要焊歪哦，不要正了，正就不用搬了。to where it began. Um, in around 2012, which um, I think was the year that uh, maybe 2013, the more or less that time, um, I was invited here by uh, Rihanna um, and um, uh, by, to take part in a, uh, the reviews of, um, uh, I think it was Social Design course, presumably at that time, 2012. Yeah. And the, at the time, uh, and that was an incredible opportunity to meet a lot of the um, tutors and also the students. It was also the time when uh, I think more or less uh, I met Tamasha Freer. And we uh, began together a project called Space Caviar, um, a, a studio which uh, still persists uh, in the form of um, productions of this kind. Um, and the, uh, in a way, I think this and a lot of the um, other things that we've worked on in the six years since then have been an attempt to understand what uh, design is today um, and how we can, uh, in a way, kind of understand what we mean by the word design, uh, starting less from a sort of an etymological perspective or from the kind of a, the idea of design as the extension of a uh, familiar, well-known um, series of actions and initiatives, um, but more to kind of attempt to develop mechanisms through which we could take a step back and uh, understand, primarily through the observation of human behavior, what um, it means to be a designer today. Um, and I think that, and so that was actually the through tomorrow afterwards that um, I met Martina, uh, and that began uh, a long series of uh, collaborations um, in through, mostly through the medium of film. Um, through which uh, we attempted to kind of understand what uh, what's kind of going on there in the real world outside of our little bubble of design. So, yeah, I think that's uh, one explanation. Because you've, you've shot the film. Yes, I do. <coughs> um, about the film.
felt uh, we were really interested in understanding what was hidden behind the news that we could read from Shenzhen. Like the hardware of Silicon Valley of hardware and uh, like um, actually Wired shot it like a really fanta fantastic like documentary short film. Uh, but we were actually really interested in understanding like going in the field and somehow um, spend quite a lot of time to um, immerse ourselves like in what was there. And that somehow um, that the film itself like is an attempt to it for the extent that it is possible for um, the band the boundary of the language and also of the knowledge of the culture itself. Um, we work like uh, regardless of this film itself, like we work with Joseph like a lot in field research. That's what we like to do. So the the, the three films we did together is actually three different ways of uh, emerging um, into. I mean, like the process of the research, the, the of the research is totally immersed in the context, in the environment, in uh, digital communities, the latest in Minecraft blockchain. And here it was a uh, bit, bit five. <laughs> um, it was Shenzhen ecosystem. Um, and I think, like personally, is what I enjoy the most. That's what I see the value of uh, of the research and design, like trying to immerse, like and observe mostly, and through observation and also like a series of observation, repeating observation repeating observing the same characters only to get like one specific good shot or a good shot sometimes. And so that's, that's the process itself. And uh, then of course there are reasons why we choose this context and why design and research is relevant uh, in Shenzhen itself. And that's like a conversation we can start. But that's a bit um, small introduction about uh, how do you connect this to the invention of the CD here in Eindhoven? Well, I, I actually, I, w I was really happy to hear that. <laughs> because many things have been invented uh, in a totally different way in Shenzhen market, electronic market. And some of the products that are next door is, are in fact like really good examples. Um, I do maybe have a question first, in order to not say something wrong. Was the CD invented by who? Philips. So it was, yes. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's like the the, the biggest. Uh, <laughs> Telecom, audio, and light. Is that really making notes? Okay. <coughs> Did that I answer your question? Like a, like a multidisciplinary team. Yeah. So, so do you, how do you translate that then back to Shenzhen? What's there? What's uh, beyond audio, light, telecoms? Because what the fuck was happening in all of these places? It's, uh, it's insane. Yeah, that, that was the, the biggest question Joseph and I yeah. continue asking of myself while trying to make an edit. It's a kind of a pro professional response from the, the jury. It's really nice to not know, because there's no subtitles here, there's no wall text in the exhibition, so you have no clue what you're actually looking at, watching, trying to kind of understand, which is excruciating, because it's really tiresome, but it's really nice because then you kind of get into it. At least I, I think that's one of the um, things that we were really kind of going backwards and forwards on almost until last night, was whether to how, wh whether to explain, essentially. And it's, I think, a conundrum in, uh, it goes beyond, obviously, this exhibition. It kind of goes, be, it goes to um, a, a question
question also from the didactic question about how do you teach design, how do you learn design, what sorts of an environment will produce an interesting, um, will form uh, the, the, the skill of observing the world and learning. And in the end, uh, we thought that maybe uh, kind of producing a sort of a almost quasi-mystical um, environment, um, an imaginary environment, which is completely real. I mean, it's all just observing. If nothing is staged or in any way, um, uh, it, it, a lot of it really is just uh, about waiting for the right moment and capturing a certain action and understanding. Uh, but this, uh, the result that comes out of that is um, something that allows you to observe and the kind of the, in a way that the uh, hope is that this uh, provokes also a different kind of understanding of these objects that you see on the walls um, and kind of seeing them, the environment they come out of and the sort of actions and uh, the, the, all of the, sort of the chain that leads to their existence one can understand how intricate, how, well I think it's something we take for granted is the uh, degree to which the environment influences the kind of objects that are produced. So in a way that this whole project is really not so much about the products or even, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's articulated through an observation of human behavior, but actually the point that we're really trying to get at is that in order to produce, to rethink the uh, act of designing, you also need to rethink the environment, the sort of the platforms which articulate that design. And, and the marketplace, the Bay marketplace, which is what you saw is really a platform for design. In fact, it wouldn't be possible without uh, without uh, not, no, the, the kind of things that are produced there and its, it's global dominance wouldn't be possible um, without the, this sort of extraordinary density of network of people. Because what, what's the end game for them? Is it to sell products, <coughs> or is it is it? I mean, it, it, in, in its most basic form, I think it's no different from the local green uh, vegetable market. It's, uh, it's actually kind of incredibly touching to see how dispassionate they are about what they're selling or making or whatever. There's, no, there's very little emotional attachment to it. At the same time, there's incredible gratification. They really enjoy the, the, the act of making these things and of selling and buying and so on. So it's, in a way, it's a kind of a, a mix between uh, the instinct of survival and the instinct of creation. Um, and there's something really magical in this um, in this environment. Uh, but also acquiring slowly um, professional skills. So that's one one of the nice things. Like uh, growing in a market like that, technology is not anymore something called the far components are not disconnected. It's like really like growing. <coughs> so, so there is really this image which I really like. It's like digging into. I don't read that as a digging into like dry components. It's actually approaching the component as if it's rice. As like um, development of different skills, mm -hmm. which uh, comes from different materials. <coughs> and this is uh, something you can ob observe in any corner. So in the same way, like a beautiful flower shop at the market, this like is made by cables, then of course there are different implications, you can read it in a different way, we can take like the many directions uh, into the conversation, but um, the, like this, the audio, uh, the, the, the telecom, uh, I think you can, yeah, you can say that in different ways, there are like this, uh, as Joseph also mentioned, the spaces, the spaces are interconnected, there is the home, the factory and the market, Without this, the coexistence and the proximity of these three results would have been different. Mm -hmm. And the really like um, constant network, so the phone itself. It's like this uh, WhatsApp overloading the everyday life, like the private life. In this. Which I'm sorry. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I, uh, seeing this made me think of the saying, it takes a village to raise a child, and it just feels like it takes a market to develop design or develop a skill. And um, how does this scale up, or how do, have you, yeah. do you have any sensibility of kind of how that, at what scale does this function, and could this be then, could, how do we learn here, or how could these people learn from that? Uh, this is a super interesting question, like, being there, like, a long, long time, uh, six, six months? One of my questions continuously repeating in my brain was, can this exist somewhere else? Can it actually be possible or special for only this 
social, political context. And this, I don't have an answer to that. I just know that there are, like in this context, there are many attempts to take out design and the meaning of design, and especially this like, really, like, word that we really like is innovation. Innovation, Which, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, that can mean many things and different scales. So, like, this is a super interesting question, and you can really answer in different ways. So, you can answer saying, what are actually the factory going now? So I can say, okay, like uh, Vietnam or Italy from this market, can we learn and apply? So it's more like a methodology, a structured methodology, or uh, a format? Yeah, sure. Just to add one thing to that. So one of the things that um, I think we were most um, intrigued by and shocked by in spending some time there was the degree to which things that we conceive consider unbelievably radical are uh, completely normal. Like, in a way, you could consider the whole of the these um, huge buildings that sort of constitute the marketplace um, ideological thing that has uh, occupies a very specific position. It's almost like a manifesto of design and so on. There, it's just completely spontaneous and it's just complete normality. And it's completely shocking that anybody could find this interesting to them. And that was one of the things that was... The, the, the fact that we could find all of this interesting was the thing that they just couldn't... The people of the market couldn't really get their heads around, including the muscle memory. It, it really, I mean, I, I have to think of a normal market as well. It's kind of <coughs> going through the apples or tomatoes to see which one is the right one, kind of going through all the different uh, products or or cables just to find what fits where, and also the kind of the little components with the magnetism or whatever they were doing, trying to do. Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the things that's super interesting is these the the, the I and mean, this is also yeah. a very Chinese um, way of, of of solving problems is just finding the absolute just chopping a piece off the side of your cat's box to sift through separate transistors from yeah. some component from another and there's an unbelievable pragmatism in the um, in the culture which is uh, is incredibly beautiful um, but the thing that's interesting is that it's um, it kind of, that operates at every scale, really. And you could really imagine this um, becoming, I think, I mean, for, certainly for Eindhoven, a really interesting model of uh, how one could structure an entire city around the design process through the kind of implantation of certain activities or certain platforms. Looking at it uh, more critically from maybe environmental point of view, uh, human rights issues, what are the things that um, you found trouble or kind of disturbing and troublesome about this? Hmm. Uh, we have to say that Shenzhen is actually um, around in 2010. Uh, there were like many, many human rights movements. <coughs> there is also a nice publication um, about uh, interviews to workers, which is because there's some ch children working in there as well. Some young children are helping out as well. Yeah, this is Saturday. Is Saturday. That's how I want to clear it out. It's yeah. Saturday. Kids go to school. The family, as my child, as my mother. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Actually, there is like a, a care. Then, of course, if you go in the in the countryside, it's different. But Shenzhen, it has this. Um, it's like a urban jungle. Somehow, that on service level, that oh, this is actually really source, but then when you see the packaging and the plastic and, and, and kind of how they distribute everything and the kind of the un Amazon like un Steve uh, or Bezos like a distribution model, it's kind of unsustainable um, to the bone. How does that function? I think this is the, the couple of points here that are really interesting to kind of unpack a little bit because I think they reveal the extent to which we are biased by our own sort of context and one of these is the um, I, well to address the last one. Those are things that are essentially being made for us. So if we're buying electronics, they're going to come from somewhere, and they're going to be packaged, and they're going to be shipped, and so on. It's like uh, you know, um, complaining about um, animals being killed to go to, 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 to when you eat sausages. It's, it's it's we are ultimately the kind of the last mile of this food chain, at the bottom of this food chain, and so that that is actually simply providing a welcome not just to us, obviously, but to the world, a service that is kind of this insatiable demand for electronics <coughs> is being satisfied by them. 
Um, and so I don't know to what degree we can unload onto them the responsibility for any sort of any of the practices that lead up. On the contrary, I think that the um, when you see them sifting through the, um, the components, and this is hopefully the next stage of the research, those are actually components that come from e-waste plants um, that have been, or, well, not only, but partly. I mean, part of the uh, certain certain parts of the marketplace are entirely devoted to it's, the it's kind of discarding money back breaks, to yeah. basically. Yeah, and then, and then separating those components, which happens in a different place, and then they're being shipped back in bags of sort of mixed items, some of which are taken out with magnets or whatever system. It's, it doesn't, that's not like where everything comes from, but there is an incredible um, ability to find kind of economies of uh, recycling and of reintroduction, much more than you would imagine, um, in fact. And the third is, I think, the question of social sustainability and the sort of presence of children and so on. Um, I mean, it's not. Yeah, it's very difficult to make sort of blanket judgments. But I didn't see. Uh, I didn't, had no reason to perceive a less balanced or less wholesome um, family structure or society there than anywhere here. In many ways, I would argue the contrary. That was an incredible integration of. There was something incredibly beautiful about the children learning to pack tape and, and uh, being really part of the sort of the economy of the place where they live and the. Day-to-day uh, -day activities of their families. Is there anybody in the room? We have two minutes left, uh, maybe one, and with a question that we haven't addressed. Yes, Mr. Bush. <laughs> on how to make it better. That's what the last two guys were doing, like observing and observing the same board, and the board is thick, there are, the, we need more welding, etc., etc. So it's a different phase, yes. Phase. And, um, and those are the factories which are like increasing, increasing in number. And that's where the question also is like, is that actually sustainable? How, how long they can survive? and uh, how they are linked each other, that's what, what was interesting was how they are link each other in order to have like a final product which can be not sustained in terms of research and in terms of making, in terms of assembly by one, only one laboratory. So that's where the, the, the factory becomes a totally different shape, which is like a network of small factories, of small laboratories, which are linked, yeah, we link each other to where the products come from. I think I opened the can of worms because more people have questions. Jose um, Martina will be here. Uh, we have to wrap up. But I have one question before everybody leaves. Because you're going to be through the exhibition. And uh, you want to see the exhibition after you've seen the film. So how do you um, hope all of us here see the exhibition after having seen the film? What do you, what do you hope for? I would say that you see people instead of seeing objects. That's the, the point. Really. Something I would like to add is that the objects selected, they were the eats of the 2016. And like, like the finished the, products. Yeah, the finished products. The one that were sold in the market, the most famous one. 
which is this nice phenomenon of uh, when a product becomes famous, like the lamp we are around, it starts to be changed and uh, modified and re put in the market, and many others are interested in continuing the evolution of it. So that, that's the... They're really like memes in uh, object or product form. In a way, and they come and go, and the factories retool and just kind of take on the next, whatever appears to be the next thing. They kind of take a gamble on retooling for the certain product, and then if it explodes, they make a lot and they improve it. And that's a whole other chapter of uh, <laughs> conversation. Next time. Yeah. Well, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So when you're curious to talk to them again, then, uh, and follow uh, our website, Facebook, and so on. Now, um, uh, there's one thing to do, and that's